Hello, Mr. McIntyre. I'm Vlad and welcome to the Crypto Insider interview. Today we will be talking about Ethereum Classic and your involvement with the project and maybe the roadmap of it. So would you please introduce yourself to the audi audience? Hi, Vlad. Thank you very much for having me. Um, when, like you said, I'm Donald McIntyre. I'm a business developer at ETC Dev. Um, I used to work in the financial industry before at UBS and Morgan Stanley. Um, and then uh, in the first dot-com uh, boom, I, I decided to go independent to become an entrepreneur. So, so I started a company called DineroNet in 2000. Um, then in 2000, uh, between 2002, 2003, the dot-com boom, everything crashed. So I had to close that, uh, that company. Then I had um, a wealth management uh, uh, firm, my, my, per, my, my own practice called the McIntyre SA until 2012. And um, since 2012, I, I read about Bitcoin for the first time and I started to follow uh, Bitcoin and the whole, the whole crypto space from knowing zero um, uh, about uh, all those things um, and, and learning in the process. And then in, um, in 2014, uh, I was very uh, enthusiastic about uh, Ethereum because I think that Bitcoin, the limitation of Bitcoin at the time, uh, at least for my vision for, for, for a platform like that, was that it, it wasn't Turing complete. It didn't support smart contracts. And I was thinking of a wealth management service always within my, my, my industry, a wealth management service um, on Bitcoin, but it, it couldn't happen because it didn't have those capabilities. So Ethereum was a great solution. So I, I started to, uh, since then I've been following Ethereum since 2014. And um, then in 2016, when uh, Ethereum deci decided to, to, to split and create a new, uh, a new uh, blockchain, when well, no, I, I, st I stuck to that uh, new blockchain called Ethereum, uh, for a while even though i supported ethereum classic as well at the time but i had the hope that uh, i could uh, convince everybody in the in the ethereum community to stick to the principles of immutability and, and not reversing the chain and high security for the chain as, as a main focus instead of high performance and stuff like that until 2018 um when when i realized that uh, the Ethereum community was not going to follow that 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 path, and they're still going to move to proof of stake and sharding and other technologies. And they seem to be very um, focused on the experimenting, which is very insecure. Um, so I finally decided uh, when when Coinbase announced that ETC was going to be listed, I said, okay. Um, what was happening with Ethereum? My frustration there, together with that that good news from etc made me move full time to to etc uh, so so um, i went to the website of etc dev um, and and i saw that uh, they were looking for a business developer and marketing person so so i applied and here i am so did you have any formal position in the ethereum community i mean eth not etc no 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 it, it'll, um, when just before Ethereum in 2015 was going to launch, which is Ethereum Classic really, because we are the mainnet, um, I, I, I created a, a project called Etherplan, which was wealth management, my vision of, wealth, of applying wealth management on Ethereum, on the blockchain. Um, and my participation was just as, a, as another, as, a, as another entrepreneur in the, in the ecosystem, as a, as a uh, like community member. I, I never had a position in the foundation or any of the official entities uh, in Ethereum. But even though Ethereum Classic is the original chain, it has made some changes to the vision which maybe the founders have had because right now you have a fixed supply, you have removed the difficulty, difficulty bomb in mining, Mm -hmm. And also, it seems like the more time progresses, the more it starts to look like Bitcoin. Yeah, well, no, that, that is the, the, the fact that it, that it looks like Bitcoin in terms of philosophy 
um, is all, was always the original founding idea no? of immutability and permissionlessness and decentralization, censorship resistance, etc. cetera, and, and to create this neutral uh, system around the world that works the same way around the world. The diff technically, it is very different than Bitcoin because Bitcoin is, um, you, you could say it's a ledger with accounts and balances, and, and, and that's a function of, of, uh, of that network. In the case of Ethereum Classic, it's the same, but on top you have two incompleteness or the ability to store programs that become decentralized programs and they can execute in the decentralized blockchain. So that, that, that in terms of uh, technical vision, they're, they're still different things. In, term, in terms of security philosophy, yes, they're the same. I've noticed that in late 2017 and early 2018, it was all about becoming the next Ethereum. We saw projects like Tron, like Tezos. Mm, yeah. I think I can name a bunch of others, which yeah. have basically raised a lot of money and they, they just promised to deliver what Ethereum doesn't. And in these comparisons, which people usually make between platforms which enable dApps, they seem to overlook Ethereum Classic. They seem to mm -hmm. just not care about it and say, oh, it's just a small project. It doesn't scale. It's not meant to take us into web 4.0 or 3.0, whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. And why do you think there is this attitude towards Ethereum Classic? The, well, all, all the other projects that imitate uh, Ethereum, uh, the, the Ethereum design, it's because the Ethereum design is very sound um, as a design that combines the layer of the cryptocurrency and the layer of the, of the decentralized computing, no? which are the smart contracts and decentralized programs. So that design evidently must be correct because everybody is replicating that. And they all promise in general uh, things that are not physically possible normally, which is Im immediate high scalability, um and and excellent governance and and things like that um and and uh, uh, almost millions of transactions per second all those promises are, are marketing promises but it's very difficult to actually implement in 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 a real blockchain because it has uh physical uh, physical uh, limitations no that's why that the only way to um solve those limitations is to building layers on top rather than modifying the base layer. Um, so that's about Ethereum, no? why it is the correct model. In terms of um, Ethereum Classic as the mainnet, why, why there is a perception that less people pay attention to it. I think my personal theory is that when, when Ethereum, what is called today Ethereum, which is the real split, the real fork, um, separated from, from the mainnet, um, they moved not only with 90%, I would say, of the DAP, DAP developers and the core developers and, and the whole community, the, the, the whole ecosystem, 90% went into following uh, Vitalik and the rest of the leaders of that, um, of that uh, network, and, and, and they moved there. So that's one, one reason why the other one remained smaller in terms of amount of people. And the other thing is because the Ethereum Foundation, which went, went with, with the fork, and, and the other advocates, personally, they all have all the money. So when you have a lot of money and you have a lot of people um, supporting your, your project, then you have the ability to make uh, much more noise than the rest. So, so that's the difference between uh, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic in terms of market positioning, I think. Uh, Ethereum definitely has 20 or 30 times more capacity today to make more noise. But um, how should I phrase it? Let's say that I'm a developer and I want to deploy a decentralized application. And why would I choose Ethereum Classic right now? Well, no, the, 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 main difference, uh, the main difference between Ethereum and Ethereum Classic is that Ethereum, first, the community doesn't have um, doesn't have um, 
an ethos of, of uh, immutability, no? just, just to call it some, something simplified. Uh, and Ethereum Classic has a firm belief and principle of, of immutability. Um, that is reflected not only in the actions of the community, as, it, as, it's, as it's obvious, because Ethereum Classic stays in the mainnet and it's going to stay with, uh, with uh, um, yeah, not reversing the, 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 the blockchain, and which is something that has already happened in, in Ethereum, but also reflects in the technology itself. Ethereum is actually moving to proof of stake. Uh, has changed the monetary policy several times uh, and is moving to sharding. In the case of Ethereum Classic, it is staying with proof of work because it's the proven secure uh, consensus mechanism. Um, it has a fixed uh, monetary policy and um, it's going to stick also to a governance system of open source, no? with no, no organizations or no centralized parties um, voting or anything like that. Or, or, or deciding things, uh, but it's going to uh, stick to just proposing technology, which is always secure, and adoption is the way that you know that, that uh, it's going forward or not, but not really uh, other mechanisms, other centralized mechanisms of governance. Can you actually run a node for Ethereum Classic right now? Because I remember seeing a post by Jameson Lop who basically constructed a machine with latest with with all the latest components like very high end machine which was attempting to run a full node of the ethereum blockchain and it was not able it had like 4 terabytes of storage it had all the processing power necessary but it was still getting errors and it was still difficult for it to synchronize with the blockchain and is well, it possible with Ethereum Classic to just run a node? With Ethereum Classic, it's, it's easier to run a node, but because the, the, the blockchain is, is smaller, because it, it uh, experienced less activity. For example, it doesn't have all the CryptoKitties activity mm -hmm. of 2017. Um, but not necessarily because it is technically different. So I would say that Ethereum Classic, uh, when it comes to time of high use, is going to experience um, it would experience the similar, similar, similar issues as, as Ethereum. Um, in terms of running a node today, I think it's, I'm not, I, like I told you before, I'm a business development and a marketing person, not, not a technical person, but I think it's much easier to install and run a node uh, of, ETC, uh, of, of uh, Ethereum uh, Classic, but also that experience that you, that blog post that uh, Jam Jamison Lop uh, published, was used by Ethereum Classic to actually solve some of those problems. For example, ETC Dev, my company, um, first built um, a Sputnik VM, which replaces the Ethereum EVM, uh, which is the, the virtual machine. It's, it's much more efficient and easier to use. Um, so that was one, one solution to, to, to LOP's uh, blog post. The other one is that uh, building stuff on top on Ethereum is also very, very difficult. So the solution to that or, or the, the proposal of ETC Dev for that is uh, something called Emerald, which is a platform of many tools for uh, new developers um, who already know how to create web applications and mobile applications to come to, to Ethereum Classic and easily build a dApp and learn how to uh, build a dApp with the best practices. No, it's, 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 a, it's a set of tools that is going to keep advancing and at some point it's going to be so easy that uh, people are going to, it's going to be similar to WordPress. It's going to be very uh, easy to create a, an application in the future. So we are, we are solving what James Jameson uh, um, wrote about. So since we are talking about solving, what is on the ETC roadmap? What are we supposed to expect from the dev team and how are you going to scale to compete with all the other people like, you know, Tron and Neo and Nem and Tezos and EOS and whatever? On the, on the roadmap, um, we have four, four things. Um, ETC, ETC Dev um, does two, two things. One is to maintain the protocol um, and um, so that project specifically is called Classic Geth. 
that is a community project and we are one of several uh, contributors um, to that project. We are the main contributors, but uh, there's others. Now there's IOHK and other independent developers. Geth Classic uh, itself is the node. Um, we maintain that and we update it. One of the things that we usually do is to integrate with new opcodes or, or things that are happening in the smart contracts industry so they are compatible with other networks so other developers can come and easily start uh, using Ethereum Classic. And then we have three projects which are uh, three projects that are part of our, our products. They are still open source but are, they are uh, built by us. Uh, the first one is what I mentioned, which is uh, Emerald. Emerald is a set of tools for DApp developers to build DApps on top of Ethereum Classic. It's already rolled out. We are promoting it. I'm, I'm doing a, a meetup in Vancouver uh, the first week of December. We already, we already communicated it in San Francisco at the ETC Labs event, and it's going very well. DApps are, um, DApp developers are very, very happy, especially the ones that never built a DApp. Because it, because it has all the best practices and it's very easy to start. Um, the second one is a Sputnik VM that I also mentioned, which is uh, an infrastructure component uh, for, for the protocol. And it just makes it much more efficient. Um, and then the last one, which is net-net about scalability, is, is called Orbita, uh, which is um, our side chains product. Um, which are which are basically networks that work exactly the same as the mainnet, but they are not the mainnet. They are they are different uh, blockchains, and they communicate with the mainnet just for some functions. Um, the, those orbitas are the solution to scalability um, for two reasons. One, because they can they they can have much more performance. They can be proof of stake, proof of authority, proof of work, or any other kind of uh, consensus mechanism uh, that, that may help whoever is using them. Uh, and second, because they provide this scalability uh, without compromising the security of the base, of the base uh, network. So if Bitcoin has Liquid and Lightning, Ethereum Classic has Orbita. Orbita, and there's other projects. There is another project, I think, that people that are working with uh, Lightning that are working on adapting Lightning to Ethereum Classic as well or at least creating a system of channels on top of, um, on top of Ethereum Classic. So, so, so in the future, I think that you're going to have base, base blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum Classic, Litecoin, Monero with different, with different uh, profiles, uh, but highly secure. And on top, you're going to have some channel systems like Lightning and whatever gets built on top of, of the others, or maybe it's the same Lightning Network and you're going to have orbitas uh, that are going to have more features. No? And, and each, uh, each kind of industry is going to create an orbita with their own features and uh, their own um, use cases and with, with the performance needs that they want. Orbitas are also going to be used at the individual level. For example, individual businesses, manufacturers, can create an, uh, uh, an orbita inside of their um, organizations and machines can, can operate between themselves inside, inside their own private network, you could call. And uh, at the home level in the future, uh, today we, uh, people are having uh, devices uh, like, like thermostats and, and door rings and, uh, and uh, uh, Alexa and, and stuff like that, but they all communicate with the central service of the provider. Um, when orbiters are used at the home level, uh, those devices are going to be all autonomous and they're all going to interoperate and the owners of the home are going to, to use them, etc., but without compromising their, their private information with centralized servers. That, that's actually fascinating because I remember reading about the roadmap of Ethereum Classic and the biggest selling point was Internet of Things. And a lot mm -hmm. of people would say, oh, you know, Internet of Things doesn't really work on the blockchain because it doesn't scale and stuff like that. But now that you mentioned Orbita and how you're going to have side chains for each dedicated task, it mm -hmm. makes so much more sense because you're going to have a base layer which is decentralized and permissionless mm -hmm. and immutable. And on top of that, you're going to build whatever application you need. And I guess that's a better plan than sharding, but it, it also takes more funds 
and you're going to need a lot of investments and development. If you, if you think of the logic, it, it makes total sense what you, what you just said. You have a mainnet which is highly secure and global. And then you have an orbiter for, for a specific se sector, economic sector or industry, then another one, then another one. And then you have smaller orbiters for smaller kinds of for sub industries, for example, and then a smaller or orbiter for a specific organization or the home. Um, so, so that kind of layered scaling um, is the most logical and it adapts uh, to physical restrictions, no? like the speed of light. <laughs> And, yeah. and computing and bandwidth and stuff like that. But how would you respond to Bitcoin maximalists who would say, you know, that can also that can also be done on Bitcoin with a side chain? Mm, I have I have to I, I like Bitcoin maximalist philosophy because it's a philosophy of totally prioritizing security, and I think that's the core message, the the meta message of Bitcoin maximalism. Um, the belief itself, if some of them believe that it, there's only, only going to be one global based blockchain and that is only going to be Bitcoin, I think that my objection to that is that um, two. One, one is that uh, 8 billion people in the future with millions of businesses and, and nations and, and, uh, and communities around the world, I don't think that they're all going to um, risk um, everything only in one network. I think there's going to be several several network networks just because humans tend to diversify diversify uh, risk. So um, the other one is that Bitcoin has limitations. I don't think that it's very easy to build uh, multiple side chains that all connect to to Bitcoin. For example, the model of of uh, Lightning Network seems very good because it's just uh, activity a network it's not a blockchain it's a network of nodes that have channels and they only post a, 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 a transaction on Bitcoin that doesn't modify Bitcoin or disrupt Bitcoin in any way so that's a, a good model but when you have something like RSK rootstock um, they had to create because Bitcoin doesn't have the capabilities they couldn't they couldn't make it totally inter in technically interoperable so they had to create um, a federation of nodes, uh, which are basically a security hole, uh, to to do some of the functions, and that that is something that I don't think is going to be resolved because the only solution is is something like drive chains. But drive chains uh, require that each new side chain has to be approved by the miners, and in in the future, if you're, you're going to have five huge miners. If everybody in the world that wants to create a side chain has to go and ask for permission for them, I don't think it's going to be a practical, a practical thing. So Bitcoin is a excellent as a store of value. And you could say like uh, the analogy of digital gold. And I think it's going to be used even, even um, many side chains that work on top of ETC. I'm sure they're going to enter transactions on Bitcoin and use Bitcoin as a store of value. Etc. But because of those technical limitations that I mentioned, I think that we need the other concept, for example, Ethereum Classic, which includes Turing completeness, but integrated with the cryptocurrency, not separated from the cryptocurrency. Everything is integrated in the same in the same system. So we shouldn't expect to see ICOs and utility tokens on ETC, right? Well, the reason that uh, that didn't happen on ETC, it was just a, a matter of, uh, in part, a matter, a matter of chance. Everybody was focused on Ethereum and, and Vitalik and the core devs of Ethereum. They're very charismatic and they go around the world and they have a lot of money to make huge conferences with a lot of marketing spend, etc. cetera. Uh, so I, I guess that it was only logical for anybody to go where the money is and, and, and where the, the people are. So, so that was one, one factor. The other factor is that if you, if you yeah, must think about it, the Ethereum Classic community is naturally uh, um, a group of people who are focused on uh, the core technology, immutability, um, real solutions rather than marketing solutions to things. And I think that um, no, I, don't, I don't remember of anybody in the Ethereum um, Classic community, even uh, Igor Artamanov, our founder, or, or Charles Hoskinson, 
specifically saying promoting ICOs or participating and and uh, and uh, doing marketing for people to come and do ICOs and so it's a mix of philosophy and attention. <laughs> okay. I read your tweets and sometimes I realize that you're very much influenced by the works of Nick Sabo and you have taken a lot of his philosophy and a lot of his teachings from his blog into what you're trying to project with Ethereum Classic. Is mm -hmm. he, would you say that he's your main influence in this field? I would say that the, the two main influence were, were, were Nick Sabo and Vitalik. I would say the first influence was Satoshi Nakamoto by reading the, 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 the white paper and reading it 30 times, even though I don't, I don't understand specifically the computer science side, but I understand the concept and uh, like, like any lay person would. Uh, so, so the, the, the principles are there no? and, and, um, and it's clearly about decentralization. So anything that goes back to centralization, or trust, trust maximization instead of trust minimization is contrary to that. So my first influence would, would, would be um, Satoshi Nakamoto. Then I met uh, in 2013 uh, Vitalik and he's incredibly intelligent. And um, he also was a strong influence, especially his philosophy of uh, rationality. Um, um, then, and then in 2015, I met Nick Sabo and just by being with him and speaking with him, you, you understand uh, many other things about the cypherpunk mo movement, the principles, and not only principles, just for principles. Uh, it's, it's principles beca because they have specific, like uh, deep, deep reasons why uh, they, 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 they exist. You know, for, for example, Nick um, is not only a person that is going to say, okay, let's create a system for money, and he goes ahead and makes it, First, he studies the whole history of money, and for that he needs to study economics, and for that he needs to study his, uh, history. So he, he goes and, and he goes back, reverse engineers everything of how, what is the origin of money and how money works in the mind of, of humans, and then he understands how, this, who this, how, how to design a system. No? I think that's how he, he created Bitgold, Bitgold, which is a um, precursor to, to Bitcoin. Um, so those are my three influences, Satoshi Nakamoto, um, Nick Sabo, and Vitalik. Vitalik, much less so uh, in the last year and a half or two years after the Dow fork, because he, he was more strongly advocating for proof of stake and sharding. And um, he also began to talk about uh, radical markets and stuff like that, and, and, and uh, using that on, and, on, on Ethereum and, on, and also... Um, quadratic voting systems so so less so today but he's a strong influence as well but i noticed that you have many arguments on twitter with vitalik and sometimes even vlad zamfir who is also romanian i i don't think i've ever spoken to him but i noticed that he is like the ideologue or how do you call people who pretty much outline an ideology and then promote it Vlad? Yes. Yes, I, I, um, I, the, the, this whole thing of, of um, like debating on social media started for me when uh, it, on the Bitcoin, I, I, I am very active on both Bitcoin, Ethereum, and now Ethereum Classic. But um, when Bitcoin advocates, some advocates started to, to talk about bigger blocks and um, it became apparent that bigger blocks was a security, uh, as a, sec a security risk or, or a threat. So of course, uh, systems like blockchains they have to go the secure path, not the risky path. So if it's a risk, then you have to stick to to, to smaller blocks and build on top. No, the, the solutions were there, different solutions. But um, so that's where 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 this whole thing of debating on on social media started, and. Um, in the middle of debating between 2015 and 2016 about um, keeping high security in, in, in Bitcoin, then the DAO hack uh, occurred in Ethereum. And um, when, when everybody started to talk about uh, reversing the chain, 
of course i was in 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 the in the camp of not reversing the chain and getting the hacker through other means like calling the fbi making an investigation um things like that but not actually reversing the chain and and that's where i started to to yeah, disagree with uh, Vitalik and Vlad and Nick Johnson and uh, other developers there um, uh, about all these issues. No? And, and, and then that brought my focus also to, and why do we have a time bomb? Um, why, why did somebody plan at the beginning that everybody was forced in the future to migrate to something? And then I started to read more about proof of stake and I started to see that uh, it was not necessarily a good idea. So, so all the all this debating with uh, Vitalik and Vlad, I don't know, started and continued. In the case of, of of Vlad, I think he has he's very worried, and he has been worried, and he expressed that I think for the first time um, in during the 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 DAO uh, debates. Um, he's worried that the blockchains can be used for bad things. Or catastrophic, not not bad things like stealing a thousand dollars, catastrophic things like uh, <clears throat> something that will wipe out a good portion of humanity or, or or things like that. And under that, under that, the most fear or 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 assumption, then he tends to try to look for solutions to governance. Um, that that bring the dec decision making to people who he feels are going to make good decisions, like like stop whatever threats are or catastrophes are going to happen to humanity. Um, I disagree with that, um, so that's why I'm I am debating with with the Vlad about those things. Um, I I think that the concept of immutability me and trust minimization also means governance minimization. So people adopt and start running nodes or using wallets or adopting a blockchain because they want to. Um, and um, once they, they adopt a set of rules and their property and their agreements are protected on the blockchain, they shouldn't be touchable by anybody else. Only people with their private keys can do whatever they want with their programs on the network, smart contracts and, and money. Installing because of a fear of a future catastrophe a centralized governance system like a global UN or a global association of, of standards for, for blockchain, I think it's a risk. I'm happy that we got into this territory because I've noticed that there is a big difference in philosophy between people who think that human beings in themselves are good actors and doing evil stuff is the exception from the norm. But those who advocate for the DOA hack and those who wanted to roll back the blockchain actually seem to have this mindset that doing bad things is actually part of human nature. And I think this is much more akin to governments which have adopted these policies which think that all of us can be criminals and we should mm -hmm. be prevented. Not that we are all decent citizens and those who are bad among us are the exception. So I, I guess to those who were for the hard fork, uh, I guess they they believe in the bad human nature and that we should maybe have what they call governance. Yes, yes, I, I think so. I, and, and also because we are, as humans, we've been living uh, in, in the last 10,000 years with governance systems now, with the, the first tribes and clans with chiefs. And then, and then the first um, city states and Hammurabi code and, and laws and, and these platforms that we created to to coordinate better as we grew in in, in, in towns and cities, and and then uh, and then we have the Roman Empire and, and 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 other empires, the Persian Empire, and and then we have um, um, the the democratic revolution in the 1700s so we created democracy democracy spread around the world there's many areas that 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 is very dirty meaning it's not a real democracy it's a sham democracy and other places where you have absolute absolutism like in saudi arabia north korea and other places um, but we, we we are used to all these governance systems and they're all they're all top down the blockchain in a way minimizes that 
um, but a lot of a lot of people uh, um, automatically think of the older systems and they are used to those and their minds think that those rules have to be applied also to future systems in the case of the blockchain the, the it's precisely about minimizing the older systems and going back to a system where individuals through their private keys control their property and their agreements and their software and their apps and and, and their programs and um, nobody else can can do anything about that uh, unless they unless you have bad key security you know in that case you 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 you, um, you lose uh, and you have to go to social systems mm -hmm. to to try to correct it but not go to the mechanical system to reverse it I recall Giacomo Zucco who told me that cryptocurrencies and blockchains are just like the free little pigs and their story. Some pigs like to build their houses out of hay mm -hmm. and they, they just burn down when the big bad wolf comes. Mm -hmm. Others just use wood and that's also easy to destroy. But those yeah. who really care about their security use bricks and stone and materials which last throughout time. Mm -hmm. And maybe that to some people, it's much more fun to go to the short term solution. I believe yes. personally, uh, this is not the opinion of my boss, I guess. A lot of people in Crypto Insider seem to be enthusiastic about Tron and about mm -hmm. Tezos and about Cardano. But I think these are just short term solutions. They just bring a solution which appeals to a need which exists now. But mm -hmm. they, they didn't have the patience, I guess, to build it on top of an immutable blockchain yeah i i, th I think that it, it, um, at the social layer people you mentioned before good people bad people or some people are born good and and uh, and those philosophies no i, I think that uh, we we are we are governed by our biology and in general if you observe biology and human nature we we sometimes lie we sometimes uh, are good we are honest uh, we, we, we are a machine, we're a Turing complete machine, and we are mostly honest and co uh, cooperative, um, but sometimes uh, we also cheat. Um, and, and, these, and these systems, that means that we, we, uh, we, we need to have the freedom to, to defend our, our individuality um, uh, all the time. No? We, we, we don't need somebody else to tell us uh, how our life has to be run because that's somebody else is very um, likely that is really uh, acting in their behalf, not in our behalf. Um, so, so um, it's okay to 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 want to to be the pig that likes to build uh, the hay house, and others to be the pig who like to build the brick house, strong and always be concerned with security. And it's also okay to apply those philosophies or lifestyles where they where they fit well. In the case of blockchains like Ethereum Classic and um, bitcoin they are specifically systems of very high security therefore the only philosophy that fits is the philosophy of the bricks and high security and and it's it's perfect that other people want to be, build a hay house but they can build their their other systems on top or some somewhere else but these systems specifically have to be highly secure i have two more questions and i see that we also have one from twitter I'm not sure if I should read it because it's about price prediction. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyway, yes, I wanted to ask you about the involvement of Barry Silbert and his company. Mm -hmm. A lot of people observed that he was very much involved when <clears throat> Ethereum Classic was about to get listed on Coinbase. And he was very vocal and promoting the coin. And then he just vanished. Uh, Barry, Barry Silbert's participation on Ethereum Classic and Bitcoin and uh, all his investments, etc., are exactly what you see. He's a very honest person and he's an incredible advocate for these technologies. And I think that he has been, um, uh, what, I, what I, I, I think I sent him an email once because he's very criticized by people. And I sent him an email telling him that he's a net, ne uh, net positive. <laughs> um, when I tell someone that, or myself, that I'm a net positive or a net po uh, negative, is when, when, when of everything you do, some things are not very good, but the m mostly, mostly good. And I think that uh, that describes uh, Barry. Um, 
all his investment, the risk he's taking, he has skin in the game, really. He puts all his capital on, on crypto. He has, he has make incredible connections between Wall Street and, and crypto uh, and things like that. I think he already acknowledges that, that uh, he, he wanted to help Bitcoin when he created the, the New York, or he, when he helped organize the, the New York Agreement. He wanted to put everybody together and to come to an agreement because he really wanted to, to implement some solution to scalability. So it was a good intention. Um, but uh, as we see, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a very good idea for a blockchain. In the case of Ethereum Classic, he has been very vocal since the beginning. First, he, he actually, him and me, we used to like debate and, and quarrel on, on Twitter or dis discuss. I don't know how, how, how to say it in English. I'm a Spanish speaker. But we no, used to I, I noticed. <laughs> I, um, um, we used to discuss on Twitter because he, he was always asking, I, I would say rhetorically, and what is what is the invest, investment thesis for Ethereum? Like he was really saying that he didn't agree with Ethereum, um, and I, I, I was always trying to tell him when uh, Ethereum is gas uh, and Bitcoin is gold, uh, um, Ethereum is too incomplete. Bitcoin is only uh, for money transfers. Ethereum is like a full service computer. Bitcoin is like a pocket calculator. All those things, and and he was always like not agreeing. And, and when Ethereum Classic came, he liked the, the philosophy of immutability of the smaller chain. And I think that he also liked the fact that it was a, a low value as a good investment. Um, and I think that he also really uh, agrees with the concept of Turing completeness on a blockchain. Um, so he was very supportive and, and the, the most visible uh, person there. And, and he created the, the ETC, the the Ethereum Classic ETF. So again, a connection between Wall Street and and um, and uh, and uh, Ethereum Classic. Um, but he's not the only the, um, person with a lot of money uh, within the the system. There, there's other, for example, ETC Labs is a separate investment group, and they are in San Francisco, and they are funding startups. They they have a pilot program with uh, with six. Ethereum Classic startups, and in 2019, they're going. They are aiming to fund between 20 and 24. Um, and um, ETC Dev, um, in a few days, we're going to announce a grant from another uh, person. So there's, there's many other people with money so supporting many other projects. Um, so even though he was the main, uh, yeah, most big whale in, in in the system originally, now Ethereum Classic is much more diversified, and Barry has a net positive influence in the whole system. And now that we're talking about money, I saw a tweet by you in which you dismissed a donation from the Ethereum Foundation to Ethereum Classic. Yeah, you want to know why? Yeah. <laughs> or maybe explain maybe people who listen to this will not know what it's about so you can give a backstory my, my personal opinion is that we are uh, still I mean there's 2,000 blockchains if you go to coin market cap and on top of that there's many thousands of dApps and, and, uh, and other stuff happening on the blockchain but at the base layer there's a lot of competition and I think that in the future there's going to be only very few um, uh, base layer blockchains say it could be between four and five uh, some people were saying 10 but it doesn't matter it's, then it's still a small uh, a small amount that means uh, that many of the blockchains that you see today in the future are going to cease to exist or become insignificant and four or five or ten are going to be the chosen one chosen ones by the world that means that we are today, like any system that needs network effects uh, and standards, we are in a standards war. Um, it has happened in the past with many other technologies and whoever are the advocates for each standard basically are competing for their standard to be the one that wins. Uh, so in this scenario, um, in, in terms of Turing completeness, um, um, I don't think that there are going to be uh, a thousand. There's going to be maybe two or three Turing complete blockchains. And, uh, and that means that other Turing complete blockchains are really competitors. So when you have the action of the advocate of one, especially when they are 30 times bigger 
and they have billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars to support their project coming and making a press release and donating you a significant insignificant amount not only for them but also for 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 the receiver um, it's really a marketing ploy i see it as a marketing ploy to virtue signal and to show to the world that they are the dominant uh, standard and the world because of the coordination problem needs a dominant standard that's why uh, these standard wars exist, no? And because it's because people and organizations need to choose a, a, a platform and a standard to communicate and to do their business. Um, so that's why is is that I thought it was a, a bad a bad um, decision from the Ethereum Classic side, which is not Ethereum Classic. It's just the the ETC Cooperative. No, it's another like a nonprofit. Uh, but the signal to the market is that of confusion. And I think that opposite to the message that we're trying to convey. Okay, so right now I should... Okay, it, it's fair that I should ask the question of Aldo Romeo Grimaldi on Twitter. And he just said price prediction and like five exclamation points. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a... Um, I think that, that, that speculators and traders are very good for any ecosystem uh, in the stock market, in the bond market. In the currency market and also in the crypto market so so it's very it's very um i would say it has to be respected that many people are interested in the short-term price also long-term investors are are key because those are the ones that the fund that fund the core projects and put the big money um however etc dev and ethereum classic we try to be low profile in terms of talking about price because we don't we don't want to call all these people doing ICOs and speculating and bringing all this, um, all, this, uh, all, all this activity that in its majority is very likely that are scams. So we want, to, we, we want to focus on the technologies and to keep building. Doesn't matter what happens outside, we're gonna keep building and we are here, ETC Dev is here and many other participants in the community to support it here in Classic in the long term. That is a very important guarantee to developers. Um, in terms of market, um, even though I don't do, uh, according to the, what I just said, I'm not going to do price predictions, but I can say that I think that in the market, Ethereum Classic is uniquely positioned as the only Turing complete proof of work, fixed monetary policy, non on-chain voting, blockchain that means is the most secure uh, Turing complete blockchain in the market today in the whole ecosystem why because if you see Bitcoin Litecoin Monero they're they're big and they are positioned in the proof of work but they're not Turing complete mm -hmm. so they're highly secure and very good for what they do but they're not Turing complete and you go to the other side the Turing complete ones you have Ethereum EOS Tezos Cardano etc they are they are uh, Turing complete, but they're not proof of stake, so they're not highly secure. Ethereum Classic is specifically Turing complete and proof of work, which is highly secure. So I think that if we stick to our principles and our technology and keep building the the, the, the best technology, in the long term is going to be uh, it's going to be reflect, reflected in the price. Muchas gracias, señor. Muchas gracias a vos. <laughs> okay, so I this was thanks, thanks, thanks to you. <laughs> I understand. Vos is also in French, and I speak a bit of French, but <laughs> yeah, they Spanish, they don't Portuguese. pronounce it like that. And vos, I think, is like the polite term. Uh, vos is the Argentinian and Portuguese uh, way. In in in, uh, in in Spain is gracias a ti. A ti. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to get posted on Crypto Insider in a few days. And uh, I hope you're happy with how it went. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for the questions. Very good questions. And you, you gave me an opportunity to, to explain things that maybe people have questions on, on, on what I say on Twitter. And, and this was a good opportunity to, to clarify. Okay. I'll talk to you on Twitter. Thank you, Vlad. Bye. Bye-bye.